The history of the American women's suffrage movement is the history of determined community organizing, fierce protest, and the power of ideals. But today's guest tells us the history we know fails to reflect the diversity of the movement that won women the right to vote 100 years ago. She's Susan Ware this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, scholars, journalists, and more to make sense of the stories that shape public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Dr. Susan Ware, a noted feminist biographer and historian. Her new book is Why They Marched. Untold Stories of the Women Who Fought for the Right to Vote. Susan, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So we want to talk to you about the book, but I want to start maybe with the suffrage movement itself. And um, can you explain the importance of that history to all of us? Well, I would start by saying, imagine that 100 years ago, most of the female population could not vote. And at that point, it's 1920, women's lives have changed pretty dramatically. They're out in the world, they're holding jobs, they're doing things, but they don't have a fundamental right of citizenship, which is the vote. And I think it was that disconnect between all the changes that were happening in many women's lives and being excluded from the franchise that really drove uh, drove the momentum of the movement. And, and the lack of the vote is a legacy of the Constitution. It's, this is this was was it written into the Constitution? Or was it just state practice that that restricted women's rights to vote? I think mainly it is st state practice, um, but it was also that it took the country and the men in charge of things a long time before they were really willing to welcome women as equal uh, participants in the political system, including voting. Um, but it is it, generally voting is a state, state law. Um, what finally gets women the vote is, a, is the federal amendment, the 19th amendment, which is what we're celebrating the centennial this, this centennial. Year. Yes. Yeah. So can you just sketch out a little bit of the history of the suffrage movement leading up to and obviously before the 19th Amendment? I mean, this didn't spring up overnight. There's a, a long history there, too, so just sort of briefly. Can I have an hour? <laughs> so we have 23 minutes left of the show. Because it, it really is almost a century-long struggle. Really? It depends on where you start it. Sometimes people started in 1848 at the Seneca Falls Convention. But I like to start it in the 1830s with the coming together of the abolition movement and women's rights. And then it really takes three generations of women to get the vote. And they're mobilizing, they're setting up organizations, they're fighting with each other, they're dealing with larger crises like the Civil War and World War I. Uh, and it's really only in the 19 teens in the last decade that things really begin to kind of pop. I call it a kind of quickening. And at that point, the suffrage movement really takes to the streets. And there's a way in which women are out there, they're marching in parades, uh, they're speaking from street corners, and they're making suffrage an issue that nobody can ignore anymore. And I think that that was really what helped to push it over the top. And yet, there remained intense opposition until the very end. And we all know the story about the vote in Tennessee. It really came down to one vote in the last step, st state for ratification. So even though it seems like it should have been inevitable that women would be granted the vote, there was a lot of opposition. And that's, that's why it took so long. How widely was this covered, the movement in the press of the time? Well, the suffragists wanted press coverage. And did uh, they get it? They got it. Now, it wasn't always 
positive. Yeah. Um, it became more positive as, as time went on. But they became really quite savvy at using newspapers and newsreels and some of the new media that was available in the 20th century to get their message out. Uh, and so even though the press was often hostile, the New York Times, for example, was a notoriously anti-suffrage newspaper. Really? Uh, yes, indeed. Not their pr well, proudest moment. We know the moment. publisher now. We'll have to have a word, <laughs> yeah. we'll have a word with them. So, uh, so, but it wasn't just the 20th century. I mean, the, the book sort of recounts not just the profiles of people who were involved in, mm -hmm. the, in the movement, but also uh, you call them objects, but mm -hmm. they're, they're artifacts of mm -hmm. the movement. What struck me is that so many of them were sort of examples of the media of the day. Sojourner Truth and her, her carte de visite, mm -hmm. right? the, um, the, the various newspapers and other publications that, that supported this. This is not just about women, but it's also in some respects about communication technology. Yes, yes, and how do you get, how do you get the word out? And so I think one of the reasons it was so fun for me as a historian to write about these objects is that these were often the way that they got, they let people know that suffrage was something that they should be paying attention to, either through a button or a banner or foreign language flyers. These are all part of their arsenal. And I think also for me, one of my goals in the book was to really try and make the social movement come alive to my readers. I think so often movements seem kind of general and broad and you have national leaders and national organizations but that's not how movements operate they're real people you know and they're rank and file and somehow being able to think about these objects and of think about someone wearing a button right. it just for me it really brought it home it made it more real it made it more personal and that's really what i was trying to do so why this book now is this timed at all to events happening in America and, and indeed globally in, in 2020 or when you began writing it a few years ago? Well, I would say certainly I had my eye on the upcoming centennial uh, and I have learned that it is in fact a good good strategy to publish a book <laughs> it's a good right market before. Say, yeah, yeah, it's a good market. <laughs> but having said that, I started the book in 2015 and I think I, I really assumed that when the centennial came, probably there would be a Democrat and probably a woman in the White House. And so in the four years that I was working on the book and after it's come out, we find ourselves as a country in a very different political situation. And among other things, that has made the topic of women's politicization and voting rights much more important and much more timely. And so I find, even though I say, oh, I'm just a historian, the topic is one that is resonating in probably unexpected ways with audiences today just because of where we are in 2020 heading into a major election. Any relationship to the Me Too movement? I mean, that's obviously one of the very strong, powerful movements that has emerged since or when you were writing them since publication. I think more, I guess what I would say is I see the suffrage story as part of a longer continuum mm -hmm. of women's political activism. And I never, I don't ever think of the suffrage movement as just ending in, in 1920. I see it as going forward. And so it takes many different forms as it goes forward, getting women elected to political office dealing with sexual harassment on the job, uh, things like that. And so I see it as part of something much, much larger. So you, you, just, you, you made a reference to this already, but in the book you, there's, there, you, you talk about the, the tension between the abolitionist movement and the women's movement, mm -hmm. particularly in the years of Reconstruction. So once the slaves have been freed, mm -hmm. what happens to that old alliance and how does that affect the women's rights movement uh, in the late 19th century? Well, there's a, the split between um, the women's rights movement and the former abolitionist movement is a, is a profound one for the suffrage movement. Because prior to the Civil War, they were... In tandem. Right. Um, but because of the strategy for the 14th and 15th Amendment, uh, certain groups wanted the priority to be African-American men to get them their rights. Other groups of women wanted white women to be included in that too. Uh, and so you have a very fundamental split, which keeps the movement apart for a good 20 years. Um, 
I don't think that's necessarily such a bad thing. I mean, movements, it often works quite well to have multiple perspectives at the same time. I do think that one of the things that's very important for us now, and also for me as a historian, to grapple with is the question of racism in the suffrage movement, which is related to your question, but is also its own issue. Right. Uh, and it's a real challenge because um, if we just dismiss the suffrage movement as being white, middle class, and racist, and therefore not of any importance, then we dismiss the vibrant contributions of African American women. And the scholarship is just discovering so many more women who were involved in this fight than we knew, and I certainly wanted to write about that in my book as well. So my strategy is to mark and note the racism of the white leadership, but also make sure that the African American women's suffrage story is very much part of that, um, and so that you see it in all its complexity. So a number of the women in Why They March were largely lost to history before you found them. How mm -hmm. did you find them? Well. Over the course of my long career as a feminist historian, I have been associated with the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe. And many of the objects and many of the papers of the women are there at the Schlesinger Library. So I had kind of a, a head start. These are women that really have been part of practically my entire career. Um, it was a challenge figuring out which ones to include. Um, you know, I decided to do 19 for the 19th Amendment. Uh, but then I knew that there were certain things that I wanted to write about as a historian. I wanted to give a, a broader geographical base. So I needed to be thinking about women who were from the West. I certainly wanted to deal with questions of race. Um, so there was a, a juggling act there, but a lot of it does come back to the Schlesinger Library. So how did, how did their papers wind up at that library and not some other library? Well, I'll have to put in a plug for the Schlesinger Library <laughs> as being one of the preeminent um, repositories for women's history. And it was founded in the 1940s, and its original core collections were the papers of former suffragists. See, oh, at wow. that point, it would have been 25 years after the movement. And so that is, that is where, okay. the, where the library really started. It has expanded its holdings much more broadly in the years since, uh, but it really is quite a quite a special special place. I want to come back to sort of the issue of race in the in the women's rights movement, particularly after the Civil War, because there was an element in the South of 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 seeking to have women get the vote because that would counterbalance uh, African American mm -hmm. men who had the vote. Is that is that a fair? statement? Yes, and it was terrifying to many white Southerners. Uh, and you you hear that, we hear that argument as late as 1919, 1920. There's still, the groups are being played off against each other. Um, so it's there, and it's ugly. Yeah. So, it was, so the, in that sense, the, the women's suffrage was about preserving white supremacy. Well, that's a little strong, <laughs> so, so, but, but in, in the South, I think that one of the reasons that they were so, the Southerners were so opposed to it was because there was a fear that enfranchising African-American women might be an opening wedge to enfranchise African-American men who had been disfranchised by, by quite Jim effectively yeah. by Jim Crow. Yeah. And I think this, what we always need to remember is that for African American women in the South in 1920, um, the 19th Amendment was at most a hollow victory because they were then kept from the polls by the same devices that kept men from. Now there were some intrepid women who managed to register to vote, but they're a small minority. D did they manage to register to vote at some risk to their well-being? Mm -hmm. They did. Talk about that. I mean, that sounds like it requires some bravery and courage. Well, and, and we're only beginning to hear their stories because the NAACP reported them as they would, they would get these local, it would be their people on the ground who had decided to go to the local registrar in some town in, in Georgia. And often they would not go alone. They would take 
you know, a, a number of women with them for moral support or, or probably physical support. And, you know, voting often comes down to the registrar who's there, uh, whether he's going to let you right. go on the, the polls or not. And there were cases where uh, African American women were able to register and were able to vote. Not that many. Um, but I think it's an important part of the story uh, and a very inspirational one. So one of the things that I learned from the book was the fact that a place like Utah, uh, when they were a territory, women could vote. When mm -hmm. they became a state, women could not. How does, how does that work out? Well, now any time you raise Utah, yeah. it's not just the territory and state issue, it's polygamy, right. which was a huge uh, divisive moral and legal question in the 19th century. Uh, on a par with slavery yes. for a lot of that history. And I think one of the things that's, that I find so fascinating was realizing how vibrant the Mormon women's suffrage community was. These women were politicized. They valued the vote, they used the vote, and the only reason they lost it temporarily was because of a federal law that was trying to go against polygamy. Mm -hmm. As soon as Utah came into the Union as a, um, as a state, it was restored. Uh, but there's a very proud tradition, uh, and I think it's important for people to know that Mormon women were very much part of the national suffrage movement. So the suffrage movement is a, a study in political activism, mm -hmm. acts large and small. Talk about that. What were some of the large acts? I mean, you have mentioned demonstrations and marching in the streets. And just talk maybe about some of the smaller ones as well. Well, I'll, I'll give you two. I'll give you a large one and a small one that are okay. happening pretty much at the same time. The large one would be the 1913 demonstration that Alice Paul organized in Washington, D.C., the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. And she had a grand parade that she pulled together in just over nine weeks. Really? And women literally taking to the streets and their floats and their different contingents from different countries and all kinds of things. And my favorite moment is when Woodrow Wilson arrives at the train station expecting to be greeted by all his adoring <laughs> supporters and he says where are they and they said oh well Mr. President or about to be Mr. President they're all watching the suffrage parade. Um, Woodrow Wilson's not one of my favorite characters so I always always like he's, that. He's a problematic figure. But, yeah, indeed he is. But uh, for a small for a small story yeah. be one of my favorite women in my book is a unknown woman named Claiborne Catlin who decides on her own, by herself, to ride a horse across Massachusetts with no money trying to build support for suffrage. And it, to me that is just a perfect example of an ordinary woman who is who decides to do extraordinary things. Wait, and what year was that? That was 1914. And did she go from Boston to Pittsfield or something like she that? She went out to the Cape, actually, and then oh. came all the way back. And she was on her own. I mean, this is a single wow. woman out at night. You had asked me earlier about Me Too. She did have a Me Too moment where a drunken man came on to her and she had to, had to fend him off. And I just think about her courage doing this and also her commitment that she felt so committed to the cause that she was prepared to spend four months on a horse <laughs> out in all elements. Well, and Was and that covered by the press? Or? It was. It was. And there's a, her papers are also at the Schlesinger Library as well as a scrapbook of the clippings and the saddlebags that were specially made for her because the only luggage she could travel with were saddlebags on the back of a horse, which also had to, to carry the suffrage pamphlets she ha handed out and um, a blanket for her horse. So it didn't leave much room for her own things. That's an incredible so, story. I mean, it, it sounds like a movie script too, <laughs> yeah. doesn't it? Really? Right. Yeah. So I wonder, you know, can you put the U.S. suffrage movement in a broader scale? Because the, the women's issue at the time was not just an American issue. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that is one of the one of the important themes when we think about the American women's suffrage movement is realizing that it is part of a global movement. And when you know, we talked earlier about the abolitionists um, 
some of the earliest connections are in the 1830s and 40s between British abolitionists and American abolitionists. And then you see in the 1880s, you see organizations being founded that are really trying to bring together women from all over the globe. Now, their vision of women tends to be women from Western European countries, and, um, and they should be looking to white women to lead. But there is a sense in which these women realize they are part of something larger, uh, and they're very aware of that. And I think that's an important part of the American story. Did any men play a prominent or even minor role in the suffrage movement? Absolutely. There was a group you could have joined called <laughs> the Men's League for Women's Suffrage. And these brave souls marched in various of the parades in New York. And there are pictures of them, this sort of phalanx of men, you know, with their banner, looking a little self-conscious. Uh, but very often uh, it was their mothers, their sisters, their wives who were involved in the suffrage movement and they wanted to show their support. This is mainly in major cities, but it also it turned out to be yet another one of those really good publicity hooks because here you had men not just opposing suffrage because that was the usual thing. Right. You had men who are willing to take a public stand. Um, and to their credit, they're not trying to take over the movement. You know, for so much of women's history, the women are the auxiliaries to the men. This is one case where the men are the auxiliaries to the women. You know, I, I'm sort of curious. So we're 100 years now from, from the 19th Amendment being, being ratified and, and becoming the law of the land. What's the legacy uh, of, 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 of women having the right to vote? Well, I think it goes back to what I said when we started out. Can you imagine women not right. having the right to vote? But I also, I, I think of it in a, in a somewhat broader sense, which is when I look around at the, the mobilization of women um, in the 2018 election, what we're seeing in this current election, and I think of these women as standing on the shoulders of the suffragists that they're part of a larger tradition of women wanting and demanding to have active and full roles in our political democratic system. And that it doesn't stop in 1920, we've still got a lot more to go. And so I see it as part of a, a continuum. And, and to me, that is the significance of the women's suffrage movement, that it's part of something much longer and larger that will go on long after I'm gone, um, because it will always be necessary. So my question was going to be, what is the work that remains to be done? And you mentioned that. What are some of the issues still remaining? I think it's clear what many of them are, but perhaps it's not entirely clear. Well, I, th I think there are issues both around women's access to political power. We certainly, in this election cycle, have seen a trend where women candidates struggle to be taken as seriously as men. And I think people are aware of that, don't seem to have figured out how to, to get over that battle. I think that's an important one. Um, women's unequal um, economic situation, pay equity is something really needs to be on the agenda. Child care, there are a whole range of issues um, that I think as as we begin to think about, as we continue to think about what needs to be done, what's different from the suffrage movement, what was unique about the suffrage movement is that it was a coalition that, that came around one basic issue. And that's pretty unusual in, for mobilizing for women or any, anything. Right now, you see women across a broad spectrum involved in all kinds of things, which is as it should be. It's not usual for women to come together under one issue. Um, and it seems to me that there's plenty out there to keep a lot of us very busy. We've got just a couple of minutes left here. You, you hinted at this earlier, when, that there was a, an acceleration in the pace of developments in the last five years. Mm -hmm. What finally turned the tide? Why, why were they finally able to succeed uh, in 1919, 1920, when they, when they weren't able to have that same success for the century before? There are various factors. Um, World War I is, is a possibility. Women really threw themselves, most of the women's suffrage movement threw itself into the war effort. And the, the wing that didn't 
was able very effectively to use Woodrow Wilson's words about making the world safe for democracy and saying, uh, President Wilson, at home, we don't have a democracy. Half of the population can't vote. And that's a kind of rhetorical device that is very effective. Um, but also when you see women volunteering and really supporting the war effort, and then, well, what really is the reason for not letting them vote? And so I think that happened. Woodrow Wilson finally changes his mind. Um, but, you know, as I said, it went down, got down to one vote in the 36 states. So it was never a done deal. So we, we only really do just have a few seconds. Are you working on something now that we can look forward to? I'm just trying to uh, keep myself busy with all of the issues that uh, I think are out there that need to be addressed and also using my stature as a, as a historian to be able to share what I have learned about the suffrage movement and make it available to people as they begin, to, as they try to make sense of, of where we are right now. And maybe inspire people. Yeah, hope so. Well, the book is wonderful. It's Why They Marched. Susan Ware, thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. We can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. Mm -hmm.